Does it seem like the world's going crazy just a little? <laughs> um, you know, sometimes I think, I wish I was one of those dudes that just didn't care about the news, you know? I, I, I just admire you guys that could care less and you're just out there, you know, it's uh, ignorance is bliss, I think. Um, but, um, but, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, being aware of what's going on in the world, that's something the Bible actually calls uh, us to do. And I'm not sure if that's like, you know, the whole crowd has to always do that. But um, uh, at the same time, Jesus taught us to watch, be ready, be sober, be vigilant. Um, and, um, and, and being watchmen is um, something I think we need to do as, as um, not only just individuals, but as fathers, husbands, church leaders, um, being men that are doing what we're called to do. And I think that's one of the problems, you know, with men today is um, more than ever, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, just, I just wonder, are we doing our job? Are we doing what we're called to do? And uh, I don't know about you guys. I always like checklists. I'm a kind of a checklist guy. Uh, you know, on my day off, I usually make a checklist. Okay, mow the lawn, check. Uh, clean the shop. Uh, never get that one checked. Uh, that was just a disaster right now. Um, I'm, I'm rebuilding a jet pump in my shop right now, and it's uh, not going so well uh, with parts. But um, <laughs> but it's a mess, uh, you know. And, and you know, Debbie's always got her list of things to do. But I, I love just checking the box, you know, and making sure I'm getting it all done. And, and there's nothing better than kind of. Uh, getting that checked off, in, in my opinion, getting everything kind of checked off. There's a good feeling when you're using your time well and you've accomplished something, you know? Um, and I, I feel like spiritually, one of, one of the things I love about the Bible is there's certain checklists given to us by the Bible. And I like to frequent uh, certain checklists in the Bible from time to time. I go to the checklists. I've got probably 10 checklists that are some of my favorites, especially as a, as a guy, just to go through the checklist and say, how am I doing as a husband, as a father, as a church leader, um, in our community? Am I, am I being who I'm called to be and am I doing my job? Uh, but we're seeing people kind of go crazy. And I, I wonder if, if some of the craziness, especially in the United States here, like the crazy stuff we're seeing, um, is that just a lot of men that dropped the ball? Um, when I see uh, people out there, like, like when I see, um, you know, 20 something kids out um, in Portland, LGBTQ, you know, supporters of Palestine, where did we go wrong? I mean, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like LGBTQ supporting Palestine in Gaza? Um, do they know that if they went to Gaza, they would throw them off a building there? Like if uh, LGBT, if you have a, a rainbow flag there, they will hang you from a crane uh, over there. Like, like why didn't they get that memo? Uh, what, what happened? I think there's a lot, of, a lot of men that didn't teach their kids to have any sense at all. Where maybe they probably didn't have fathers. It's amazing in our culture, we have, um, you know, uh, one third of all pregnancies are uh, terminated in abortion. That's the first problem right there. Um, and then, you know, uh, one third of all uh, babies that are born uh, don't end up not having a father in the home. Um, so, you know, there's a huge problem right there. But we as men, I think there's, there's certain things we need to do. If we're, if we're getting a, doing a job and, and a job well done, um, then I think that our families will be healthy. I, I'm convinced if, if, if you and I as men do what the Bible tells us to do, um, then everything's gonna kind of work out. The Lord's gonna cover us. He's gonna you know, give wisdom to our family and our kids. But um, the, one of the things I worry about is I might be really good at one thing, but I dro do I drop the ball on another thing? That's something to ask yourself. How am I doing on the complete checklist? And, and I love this list here in 2 Timothy chapter two because Paul says, this is how we're to roll. Um, uh, and he, he gives us sort of a job description. It's, it's, it's a little bit like, um, not a job description, but um, all the jobs we have, what we're supposed to do. And uh, I think it'd be good for us to review that just this morning. And, um, and see, you know, how am I doing? This is, a, this is a thing for you to say, Lord, how am I doing in these areas? Um, and what are my strengths, but what are my weaknesses? This is kind of a good way to look at it. So let's take a look, 2 Timothy chapter two. It's a, sh a fairly short chapter, uh, and uh, we'll just kind of do a little, a little deep dive into this. Um, Paul, uh, the apostle, is talking to his young protege, uh, Timothy. Um, Timothy is a young man who, um, by the way, he's got a huge job of, in front of him. Paul, you know, went to Ephesus uh, where uh, no one was saved. Like Ephesus was a huge metropolis, uh, metropolitan uh, city, uh, giant, giant uh, town back in those days. Um, it'd be sort of in a little bit like the New York City of, of uh, that region. 
And um, Paul goes in there and just turns the city upside down. Just one little dude preaching the gospel and, it, and tons of people start getting saved. Um, you know, and uh, they're a wealthy town. Why was uh, Ephesus wealthy? Because they were, <laughs> they were worshiping the goddess Diana. That was their main thing. People came from all over the world to worship this multi-breasted goddess of Diana. And, and these silversmiths made huge dollars making these little gods and goddesses. So when people came, they could buy their little silver Dianas. Um, and they were getting rich off of that. Well, Paul, goes in there and preaches the gospel, the whole town starts repenting and getting saved and nobody's buying Dianas anymore. So the silversmiths freak out and they cause a riot. Uh, you can, there's, a, there's a theater there in Ephesus that, that's an amazing sort of, we call it an amphitheater, they call it a theater, but it's um, uh, huge in Ephesus. And there was a, the, the silversmiths dragged Paul and we're gonna, they were gonna like beat him up in, in this riot. It was just like downtown Portland. But anyway, um, so, so Paul has to bolt. He has to leave uh, Ephesus because of this riot. Uh, because he's turned the town upside down. Everybody's becoming Christians. The silversmiths aren't making any money. And so they're all mad. He gets run out of town. And so then he goes to Timothy. Hey, Timothy, I got a job for you to do. I want you to be a pastor in Ephesus. <laughs> like, like, this is great. Um, but but I, I, I do think that says a lot about Timothy. If Paul's gonna give Timothy this job in Ephesus, he wants to equip him to do the work. You and I are pastors in Ephesus, uh, whether you know it or not, we have work to do here in Portland area and, and the world that we're living. And uh, I think the same way Paul was equipping Timothy is the same way you and I need to be equipped as men today. Um, so let's take a look. Uh, it's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse one. He says, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Okay, so um, the, the first job description we're gonna look at today is the idea of being a steward, stewardship, and that we need to choose to be faithful, to, to be good stewards of that which the Lord has entrusted to us. He says that, you know, the things that you've heard of me, Timothy, um, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. Um, by the way, I, one of the dangers I think, um, you know, you know, uh, plagiarism is kind of an interesting discussion when it comes to teaching the Bible or ministry. Um, uh, of all the, you know, I, I understand why plagiarism is a problem uh, in, in, in some circles and stuff like that, but can I just say, uh, when it comes to the Bible, uh, if, if I hear somebody teaching something that I have taught, um, and like I, I've heard guys like almost word for word teaching stuff that I've taught. Um, I, I actually kind of rejoice in that. I'm not, oh, he's using my material. Uh, I'll tell you why I don't feel that way. Because if it was my material, it's, you might as well throw it in the garbage anyway. My material is a waste of time. It's, it's whatever I'm saying in a sermon or a teaching, I would hope that um, I'm, I'm giving enough scripture and enough of Bible, enough of what God's wanting to say to his church that I could say like Paul, hey, to the young men especially, hey, the things you've heard me speak, that's what I want you guys to go and speak. Um, and you know what's great about that? I've kind of learned, there's a couple things. There's this pressure on young pastors to come up with something new, something new and exhilarating and exciting. Um, but if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. Um, uh, we need to stick to the old doctrines. And one of the mistakes is these young guys feel like they have to come up with some new thing. And so we end up with all kinds of crazy harebrained stuff and doctrine that's off the rails because we're not willing to stay with old school. And old school theology and doctrine is where we should stay. And I think you and I should take the things Paul said and go and say those things and, and, and keep, keep staying with the good old truth that has withstood years of scrutiny and, and time. Uh, be careful with this whole, you know, coming up with some new uh, thing. I, I think that's a, a big mistake. So when it comes to plagiarism, I think there's kind of a funny thing when it comes to teaching and ministry. Um, and, and here's another thing, there, there is nothing new under the sun. The, the good teachings that I have heard, um, uh, I remember as a young guy hearing my pastor thinking, wow, this is powerful. And then, and then I would read some other guys and go, wait, I think this is where my pastor got his information. Uh, J. Vernon McGee or you know, Warren Wearsby or you know, G. Campbell Morgan. Like, like um, you know, you, I, we're supposed to stand on the shoulders of the guys that have gone on before us. And I think that's, I just wanna make sure you guys understand, we have light, not only license to do that, but almost like a stewardship of information. 
And I think that's something that we, uh, we can um, you know, really rest in. Uh, and that's on small scale or big scale. Small scale, uh, you know, I, I hope that when we're doing these iron works or when you go to Wednesday night Bible study, I hope you guys that have little kids, you're constantly listening say, hey, what can I transfer from what I'm learning here at church to my little guys, my kids? Um, you know, once in a while I'll say, hey, here's a great, you know, family Devo for you. It's all spelled out for us right here in the story. You know, uh, Samson, uh, sin, you know, blinds, it, it binds and it grinds. There's a three point thing you can talk to your kids about. Uh, Samson's eyes were poked out because of his sin. Uh, he ended up bound up with chains because of his sin. He ends up grinding at the wheel day in and day out because of his sin. There's a three point teaching right there. It's spelled out for you in the Bible for your family, div- next family Devos. Or if you're a grandpa, you can do family Devos with your grandchildren. And, and, and you got a spelled out, well, Brett, that's your material. Nope, I'm sure I got that from somebody else. Um, and I'm just being a steward of the things that I've received. Um, now, of all the things you should be a good steward of, what's the top of the list? Well, it says here in verse one, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Boy, that's something that uh, a lot of men just don't really wanna be strong in. We wanna be strong in you know, intelligence, or physically strong, or strong in opinion, or strong in fill in the blank. But the one thing Paul says to young Timothy, be strong in the grace there, that grace that is in Christ Jesus. Grace, our undeserved, unearned favor that God has given to us. Um, you know, Paul is telling Timothy, you gotta camp out on that issue of grace. And, and in a sense, that's one of the things he's to be a good steward of. Uh, he doesn't say be strong in legalism, Paul, before he was saved, he was the legalist of all legalists, the Pharisee of all Pharisees. But Paul had to lose that sort of uh, legalistic mindset and get more into that. Man, we're saved by grace through faith. Um, you know, Galatians 2, 21, um, Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died in vain. In other words, Jesus would have wasted his time dying on the cross if we still have to keep the law. So be a champion of grace is what he's telling young Timothy. Um, That's a huge thing you and I are called to be champions of as well. Um, Be strong in the grace, not strong even in obedience. Um, I know some of you guys probably hear me teach on grace, you know, and and saved by grace through faith. And I I talk about that a lot because that's what we're supposed to be strong in. But there's always that dude, yeah, but what about obedience? Uh, What about obedience? Uh, It is something we're supposed to do. Yes, the Bible teaches us to obey his word, but but you will not ever really be successful completely in that, especially if you haven't been saved by grace. You gotta be saved by grace, then um, you find yourself repenting once you are saved. When you become a Christian and you're saved by grace, then it's the Lord's kindness that leads you to that repentance, which ultimately leads to obedience. But don't get the cart before the horse. That's why we gotta be strong first and foremost in grace, um, then, then the obedience part comes later, um, really important. Um, and then Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, of course, this is the most classic and, and maybe one of the most important scriptures that helps us understand how you're saved. For by grace are you saved <clears throat> through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Um, can you be trusted with the things you've been passed on? Um, one of the things that, you know, when you're a steward, if you're a good steward, if you, if you have a, somebody who works for you um, and they're really good and you, you give them a job to do and they always nail it every time, um, you tend to give them more jobs because you can trust them to get it done. Um, the people that don't get it done, you don't give them very many jobs. Now, some of you might say, yeah, I got my boss piles stuff on me because I'm the only guy that gets stuff done. Um, but oftentimes, if that's the case, you're the one who gets promoted. You're the one who moves up the, the chain uh, you know, in construction or in a workplace environment. <clears throat> in the same way, I wonder, does the Lord give greater things to the man who's a good steward of what he's already been given? Well, there's parables, if you can even think of right now, that say, yes, the Lord does do that. Um, there's an Old Testament passage in Genesis 18, verses 6 through, 16 through 19, where remember before God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, um, he shows up, the Lord himself, with two angels to Abraham's tent that hot afternoon. 
And, uh, and they, the Lord's talking to him. And then the Lord, you know, the Lord says, says something uh, there in 16 through 19 in Genesis. Um, he, he sort of a- asks a question rhetorically. He, sh- he said, should I hide this thing that I'm about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah from Abraham? Or, you know, or should, I, should I reveal to him and tell him what I'm gonna do? And then, then he says, um, he says I, will, I will reveal this to Abraham because I know Abraham that he will take the information and entrust it faithfully to his kids. He's gonna take what I'm telling him and passing it on to his family and his kids of what I'm doing. In other words, the Lord's saying, uh, I wouldn't have given Abraham this if he wasn't faithful with the information I was entrusting him with. But because he would be faithful with that information, the Lord says, I'm going to reveal this to him. Listen, this is important guys. Revelation from God doesn't come by accumulation um, as much as it comes by distribution. There's guys that I know that study the Bible and study, 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 and they read books and they're, they're really well read and they study, 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 but they never, they never uh, give it out. They, they're, you know, the Lord entrusts them with good information, but they never give it out. So we have a bunch of spiritually constipated brothers walking around, you know, and they, they tend to be weirdly legalistic and they're know-it-alls and stuff, but they're, they're not actually using the information. They're not actually giving it out. Um, and I think that's an ugly thing spiritually, but when you've got a man who's taking it in, but he's also distributing and, and passing it on to his kids, his grandkids, his family, the people that he works with, his friends, um, then the Lord, I think, gives you even greater understanding of truth and, and he will entrust you with the greater things. So that's the first job description. Uh, job that we have to do is to be good stewards of what God gives us. And chiefly, the most important thing is to be a good steward of his grace. Um, number two on our list here, it goes into verse three. Um, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that war, uh, warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Um, this, this is the number two job description you and I have is to be a good soldier. It's interesting, you know, um, to watch what's going on um, there in Israel and the Gaza Strip and all that. But did you see the way Israel responded? Um, you know, if you know the, the politics of Israel this past year particularly, has been nothing but division. People were thinking there was gonna be civil war in Israel because of Benjamin Netanyahu and some of the decisions he's made. And you know, whether you agree with them or not, the, the, the nation was completely divided and, and maybe the worst since it's uh, 75 years of being a, a country. Um, but this Hamas attack that took place, um, you know, uh, suddenly, um, immediately joined everybody together, and they called uh, um, 300 to 400,000, uh, you know, uh, soldiers back into duty, active duty. Um, but um, they had like 115 percent return rate, like the of people that had to be there. Uh, showed up over 100%. Uh, and the people that didn't even have to be there, uh, people were lining up at the airports in New York City uh, to go and, and fight for the IDF uh, that were part of Israel because they, uh, they were called to duty. Um, it, it, Israel's unique in that way, uh, in a lot of ways. You, you kind of wonder what nation, you know, how would the United States do if we had to suddenly, you know, uh, do that, uh, call, call people to action? Uh, I'm not sure anybody would show up and they'd have to shave all the blue hair off and, and uh, figure out how to train, you know, and make sure they had their pronouns just right. And all, like, wow, nothing but work, work, work. Um, but you gotta admit, and, and um, if you follow what the IDF does, they really are kind of an amazing uh, army in a lot of ways, um, doing kind of the impossible uh, in so many ways. But, but um, you know, you gotta love a, a, a soldier that knows what they're doing. Um, you know, uh, interesting, knowing that they would be mowed, mown down by Nazi machine guns. The first soldiers landing on, on Omaha Beach, they're, um, uh, you know, they, they charged out of those, uh, those boats, um, you know, just, you know, valiantly. Like, you know, there's movies that are made, countless movies, because that was just such an incredible, um, you know, battle. Um, but uh, what would cause a man to hit the beach climb, or climb up a cliff knowing that there'd be these guns, you know, spraying bullets your direction, you know? Um, they've studied since then uh, pretty in depth 
uh, you know, the, the, really what, what made the heroes of D-Day um, actually do that? Um, you almost wonder would, would our generation of you know, people today have that same um, you know, bravery? You, you kind of wonder about that. Um, but um, why did they do that? Um, they found it wasn't for you know, God and country as much. Um, they found as much as a respect and admiration for their commanding officer and fellow soldiers. It was more of a localized inspiration that made them say, we're gonna do this because of respect for their commanding officer and their fellow soldiers. Uh, the concept of fighting of one's country might be too big for a person in battle to be uh, letting that be the motivation. Uh, it's a little too abstract, but risking your life for another person that's right there with you or one of your commanding officers um, makes the goal more worthwhile. That's what the studies found. Paul didn't give Timothy you know, 10 theological reasons why he should serve the Lord. Rather, he just said, um, you know, as his commanding officer, be a good soldier, do your job, don't be distracted. Um, what's a distracted soldier? It says here, be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth, verse four, entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Um, you know, if you're in battle, you've got to be fairly focused. You can't be, um, you know, scattered and, you know, uh, and, and even the military won't even allow you. Hey, I think I'm not going to go to battle today. I, I've got to go do some shopping. Uh, I've got to, you know, call my girlfriend. Uh, no, that's not going to fly. Everything, when you're in battle, everything else has to kind of go by the wayside. Um, the, the Christian life, brothers, is not a playground. It's a battleground. I feel like that's one of the problems with um, a lot of Christian men today is it's all about the playground. We wanna you know, just play around in life, have a good time. It's all about my pleasure, doing what I wanna do. But you know, we have to remember you know, Ephesians 6 uh, you know, tells us that we're in, in a spiritual battle. This is warfare. And I, I wonder if some of the problems we see with you know, just the enemy, Satan, doing his thing here in the United States of America is because a lot of men, are, it's, it's just a playground to them, not a battleground. We're called to do battle spiritually. Um, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual to the tearing down of strongholds. And I think um, that's one of the problems. We don't realize we're in a battle. Uh, what's the worst thing a guy could do, in my opinion, is to show up to a battle and not realize you're in a battle. You're standing in the middle of the battlefield. You don't have your armor. You don't have a weapon. You're just kind of, what's, what's going on here? Pew, 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 bullets are flying. That's this world. That's this life. And we wonder why men get picked off spiritually. Why are men dying? Why are young men deconstructing their faith? Um, why, why are there people walking away from, the, from going to church and being part of the Christian church uh, at all? It's because um, they all think it's a playground when it really is a battleground and people are getting picked off. Um, and I think men should stand up and realize we're called to be soldiers, a good soldier that's faithful and enduring and hanging in there to the end. Um, it's not a playground, it's a battleground, uh, important. Well, number three, so we got steward, we got soldier. And then number three, we have an athlete. Uh, look at verse five. It says, and if a man also strive for the bastries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. Um, this is a, this, you might miss this in the King Jimmy here, um, what, what it's actually saying, striving for the masteries, what's that? Well, the word strive is the Greek word athleo, where we get our word athletic. So that's kind of an implication there. Um, uh, even perhaps some say it's like athletic, but it's the wrestler, kind of like the Olympic wrestling kind of thing. Uh, and if you are a wrestler in the Olympics, um, yet you will not be crowned. And the word crowned there is the word Stephanos, which, which is the, uh, remember the little Olympics of the ancient Greek games? They'd, they'd give you a little leaf crown if you were standing on the top podium in the first place. They'd give you a little Stephanos crown. Well, that's the crown Paul's saying about. He said, man, unless you do it lawfully, go by the rules, you won't win the crown. Um, so he's talking in athletic terms, um, Paul being familiar with the Greek Hellenistic world and, and the athletic uh, thing. By the way, Paul constantly referred to athletic things. He was using uh, um, athletic sort of imagery um, the whole time. Um, <laughs> you gotta play by the rules. Um, I remember reading this article, a marathoner loses by a mustache. So read the headline of Associated Press. Um, it appeared that... Um, uh, uh, Abbas Tami of uh, Algeria was an easy winner of the Brussels Marathon until someone wondered where his mustache had gone. Checking eyewitness accounts, it, it became quickly evident that the mustache um, uh, he, he, that he uh, started with 
uh, he, when he ended the race, he didn't have the mustache. Well, as it turns out, his coach, was, which was a spit image of the Tehami, they both looked exactly the same. Um, uh, Hamami had run the first seven and a half miles of the race and then dropped out of the pack, disappeared into the woods and passed his race number, uh, number 62, to his pupil. And then they looked exactly the same. So the race auger said, one just had a mustache, the other didn't. So, so um, it's expected the two will never run again, be allowed to run in Belgium because they cheated uh, by trying to swap out. Um, I, I feel like there's people that are trying to cheat this race Paul says, I run the race to win the prize. And um, it's like an athletic thing. So if you're not into the soldier imagery, um, a lot of you guys are into the athletics and sports and stuff, but um, Paul uses that imagery. We're supposed to be like athletes playing by the rules. And if you don't play by the rules, um, then you don't win the prize. Uh, what's the rule book for the Christian man? Um, the word of God, you know, that's, that's, that's easy. Uh, but we're supposed to go with what the word says. Um, I think there's men that try to cheat uh, their way through life and they wonder why they're not winning. Um, if you wanna win, you gotta go by the rules. Um, you know, so if a guy, if a dude say, well, I wanna, I wanna win. Well, what, are you playing by the rules? Um, you know, are you, are you sleeping with your girlfriend? Because that's not playing by the rules. The Bible, the rule book says, it's good for a man not to sensually touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, which is sexual immorality, let every man have his own wife, and every wife have her own husband. And the marriage bed, the Bible says, is undefiled. Sexual, sexuality and marriage is a beautiful creation of God. Anything that's outside of marriage that is sexual is called fornication. And the Bible, God tells us, guys, flee fornication. Run for your life from fornication. But in our culture, young men, old men are running for fornication. We're, we're diving headlong into fornication. We live in a culture of fornication. And we wonder, why am I feel like I'm losing in life? Because you're not playing by the rules. And man, we could go on and on with the list of, you know, uh, are you a grouchy husband that's mean to your wife? You're gonna lose. You're not playing by the rules. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. How does Christ love the church? Unconditionally, sacrificially. Um, he's compassionate and kind-hearted and merciful, never yelling, never barking out orders, orders but being kind and, and patient. Uh, like, this is how you and I are called to do it. That's the rule book. Yeah, but my wife, but you don't know, she's always mad at me for leaving my socks out. It doesn't say that if she's, if she's mad at you, love her as Christ. Are we the bride that Christ loves because we're perfect and we don't put our socks out on the floor? Um, no, we're a total messed up church. Uh, here comes the bride. I look at this group of brides here, I think, oh man, Lord, how is this possible? You and I are called the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. It's okay, the ladies are called the sons of God, so it all works out. But, but, but when I see you guys, I'm like, oh, I hear here comes the bride music in kind of a minor tone. But uh, as it turns out, uh, we gotta play by the rule book. And if you're, if you're wondering why you're, you're losing in life, don't be shocked if it's because you're not, you know, running the race lawfully, if you would. Um, you know, uh, it says, you know, the word, um, you know, athlete, playing by the rules, that's number three that we're talking about here. Um, it says, you know, uh, Paul talks about this so much. In fact, I love 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. It says, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they that do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. In other words, this is an eternal reward we're looking at here. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty or uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body, uh, my, uh, keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Um, um, you know, Second Timothy four seven. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's what all of us should be able to say on our deathbed that we've run the race, we've fought the good fight, um, that we've finished the, the course or finished the race. Um, wouldn't it be great to go out strong on this? You know, um, it, it was kind of fun. I remember my senior year uh, uh, it was a tough year in football, our football team. My junior year, you know, we were a tiny little school in what is the equivalent of 6A today. So we played against Medford, Roseburg, uh, but we had 800 students in our, in our school. So it was kind of, uh, I think we had two, 200 seniors 
in our class. So it, we, we were always getting trounced. But my junior year, we, we almost went to the playoffs. Uh, it was great. Uh, we tied, we went into overtime with Roseburg, who won the state champion that year. So we had actually an amazing year. The next year, my senior year was horrible. I was the only guy on our team over 200 pounds. Everybody else was smaller uh, and we were just horrible. I think we only won two games out of the whole year. But, um, but I, I, I have fond memories of that year, almost more than the year before. And I'll tell you why. The last play of the last game of the last time I ever put on a uniform, um, I remember it was great because uh, I was the team captain and uh, you know, of a bunch of losers. But um, um, we, we were bad, we were really bad. But, but I remember uh, we went out with a bang uh, and what it was, uh, NC State did a, a play on TV, uh, one of the games uh, earlier that week. And it was hilarious. Uh, what they did, uh, we copied. So the final play of the last game I was in, I was, I was a linebacker on defense, offensive guard on offense. And on the offensive guard, what a no glory situation. When you're a guard, you're just there, you know, filling a space. You know, it was a really bummer, you know, no press uh, unless you were offside or something. Um, but, um, but here's what we did. The, the, the quarterback um, uh, takes the snap, uh, and then he runs back like this, and, and, but it's the, the, the center actually keeps the ball. Um, you're like, center sneak? No. Um, uh, quarterback, he runs over and he yells, fumble! And our whole team runs over this way and starts uh, diving on the ground, uh, receiving the fumble. Meanwhile, the center actually put the football right next to his foot and sat it on the ground. So it was technically a fumble. Um, if, if he would have kept it, that's not legal. But he did set it on the ground, which, and then they yelled fumble and they all, so all the guys, I'm the offensive guard and I just reached down and grabbed the ball. Duh, 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 duh. Uh, uh, I'm not a gazelle, if you, if you didn't notice. <clears throat> but but uh, <clears throat> it was great because everybody ran this way except for the safety. Now the safety, you know the safety, the fastest guy in the field. But for an offensive guard, it's like, Bring it on, little safety. And uh, I was able to just kind of, you know, drag him all the way through to the touchdown. I made a touchdown the last play of the last game. An offensive guard making a touchdown, the final play of his career, not a bad way to go out. <laughs> you know, I wanna say, uh, I wanna go out in this life strong. And it's so sad how many men go out, not with a bang, but with a, with a boom. And like uh, failure, loss, divorce, job stuff, uh, financial ruin, um, spiritual meltdown, moral decay. Like it's so sad seeing how many guys go down in such a bad way. But Paul said, man, I wanna, I wanna finish strong, like a good soldier, like a good athlete. So you got steward, soldier, athlete, number four on our list, um, farmer. Uh, let's see what he says here. Um, the, the operative word here um, in the Bible is husbandman. That's, that's kind of a way of saying a farmer. Look at verse six. And the husbandman, um, that laboreth must first be a uh, partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Um, I love this. Uh, the seed of David planted um, w would be, uh, you know, Jesus who was raised from the dead, which, which is the, the first fruit of, of Jesus's ministry, his resurrection from the grave. Um, but, but I love what he's saying here. Um, he says, uh, the husband or the farmer that lab labors, he must first be partaker of the fruits. Um, you know, uh, if you're not taking into the fruit of your own labor um, and, and enjoying that, you're gonna not, not have sustenance. Um, you gotta be, feed first uh, so that you can keep farming. That's the idea. Um, and the Bible uses this farming imagery all the time, the idea of patience, tilling, planting, watering, waiting. Um, these are all images that the Bible teaches about good, solid, biblical, spiritual men. We're like farmers who do the work, but we also take of the fruit of that work. And if we don't, then we're in trouble. Um, the, the, the first fruit that we need to take of is the resurrection from the dead. That's the, that's the link Paul's making here. You gotta be saved, you gotta become a Christian. If you're not a Christian and you're trying to work through this life, uh, that's, you're gonna die uh, and end up in total death and destruction for eternity. So you gotta first take the fruit of the seed of David um, but then after that, just to be a good farmer. Uh, Proverbs, uh, Solomon writes this in Proverbs twelve eleven: He that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. 
Um, one of the things we need to remember is um, a lot of people try to get through this life with you know, cheats, uh, get rich quick schemes, uh, trying to bypass stuff that we have to do, figuring out shortcuts. But oftentimes those shortcuts are dead ends and we have to watch out for that. There's nothing um, like good old fashioned serving the Lord with hard work. And, uh, and, and if you till your land and do the work and be patient, then, then you will be satisfied with bread. Um, I got to grow up on a little farm uh, when I was a little kid. And uh, you know, we had, a, it was a little farm, but we had cows, sheep, horses, chickens, <laughs> rabbits, quail, uh, bees. Um, we had a little bit of everything. We had alfalfa field. We had um, uh, you know, um, you know, all kinds of stuff on our little farm, little orchard. Um, uh, and it's funny because I talk so fondly about it, I, um, you know, because I, I do have good memories of all of our farm days. Uh, I remember when my mom, uh, one one evening, uh, f- a year into our farming, as it from you know uh, starting that, she at dinner said, "Everything at our table here tonight is off of our farm." And I remember just feeling like a certain satisfaction. Well, all the years I talk about this, my wife Deb, she's like, "Oh, Brett, we need a farm." I'm like, wait a minute, I, I, somehow I oversold this. A farm, <laughs> farm is a lot of work, man. Uh, and me and my sisters, like the only problem with milk cows is they don't stay milked. Uh, uh, we never went on vacation. I, I did, I did, our family never went on vacation. Uh, I remember when I moved out of the house, we still had never gone on a vacation ever, my family. And uh, we had to kidnap my mom and dad for like their 40th wedding anniversary because they'd never gone on a vacation. So we, we literally kidnapped my mom and dad, took them to a place on the, on the coast and didn't give them keys to a car. So they were just stuck there because I knew my dad would come back and go to work. Um, but that's the way I was raised. Like nobody takes vacations, you just work on the farm. Um, but, um, but you know what's funny is uh, that's kind of the imagery, man. A farmer is gonna do the work and it's kind of a consistent work. You can't just take time off uh, when you're doing farming. Uh, you, it's something that you have to stick with, with patience and consistency. And that's kind of, I think, part of what Paul's saying here, um, to be a farmer, which speaks of uh, you know, steadfastness, especially when it comes to the gospel of Christ. So that's, what, that's the uh, number four on the list, farmer. Number five, we gotta hurry through these. We're running out of time. I've only got 30 more to go. No, not that many. Uh, number, number five uh, is prisoner. Uh, what? You gotta be a prisoner? Yep, check it out, verse nine. He says, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, um, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation, um, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we also shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Here's where Paul kind of taps into this idea of a prisoner. Um, you say, Brett, that's not really an occupation. Well, it was for Paul. He spent a lot of time in prison, but, but the reason I call it a, a, an occupation uh, for Paul is because he didn't check out when he was in prison. I think if I were Paul and I ended up in prison, I'm like, well, I'm just gonna sit here and rot. Uh, I was working for Christ, for the cause of Christ, and look where I ended up. Thanks a lot, God. But guess what Paul does? Paul just says, I'm gonna be the best prisoner I can be. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a funny little uh, thing that I think is, is just almost, there's so many little comical things in the Bible, but um, do you remember when Paul was imprisoned in Rome? One of the things that Paul said to the Romans, he said, the, um, the, some of the guys from the house of Caesar greet you. Now, this, this is, this, this, you might miss this, but this is what Paul was imprisoned there with a bunch of Romans and Roman guards. And most scholars believe Paul had led a bunch of them to Christ. So when he says, those of the house of Caesar greet thee, he's saying there's dudes in Caesar's house, part of the servants of Caesar, that are greeting the church in Jerusalem or the Christians elsewhere. Um, And Paul must have been on the job even when he was in prison. Uh, preaching the gospel, sharing the good news. We know Paul and Silas, when they were thrown in prison, did they just check out? No, 
they prayed and sang praises to the Lord uh, that night and then the Lord busted them out of jail. Like, like there's so many cool stories about Paul uh, in prison and he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the best of the situation. That's why he says, I'm, you know, uh, even though I'm suffering in, you know, unfairly. Now he's not talking about going to prison because you really did something wrong. This is the idea of being falsely charged. Brett, are you suggesting we're gonna be thrown in prison? Well, that could happen, I think, in our future, believe it or not, uh, possibly. Um, but I'm talking more in a spiritual way because sometimes you feel like you're in lockdown and, and, and you know, there's no options, you're stuck where you are, and a lot of guys will sit there and pout. But you don't get anywhere by sitting around pouting. Don't complain about what you can't do. Do what you can with whatever situation you've been given. The Lord will, will be faithful to give you job descriptions, even in the most impossible of situations. Um, there's a reason for being in prison under false pretense. Um, and that's the situation that Paul had. Consider Joseph of the Old Testament there in Genesis 39. You know, Joseph had a rough go. Uh, he was sent by the father to seek out his brothers. And then when they found him, they hated him, threw him in a pit, left him for dead. But then they thought, no, let's sell him for money. So they pulled him back out of the pit, sold him as a slave to the Ishmaelites. And, um, and then the Ishmaelites take him to Egypt and, and sell him off there to, uh, to become a slave to a dude named Potiphar. Uh, so there's Joseph, okay, I'm a, I'm a slave. That's a bad day at the office. Um, but what does Joseph do? He says, I'm gonna be the best slave I can be. Um, he could have pouted or complained or you know, thought, you know, uh, anti-Semitism, <laughs> but he didn't. He said, nope. I, I'm gonna just be a good, and so he served Potiphar well, and Potiphar made him in charge of the whole house. Well, Brett, yeah, but he was accused of rape and thrown in prison. Yeah, that's what Joseph happened to him, he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. So he ends up in prison, but what do you think Joseph does? He becomes the best prisoner he can be. And so the, the keeper of the prison, well, it, I'll just show you the verse, Genesis 39, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. <laughs> Going from you know, um, a slave to a prisoner. That's, that's going from the fire pan, frying pan into the fire. But because Joseph becomes the best prisoner he can be, if you know the rest of the story, God raises him up to the second most powerful man on planet earth at the time because of his faithfulness. Um, I wonder how many of us are stuck in prison sort of figure, figuratively um, and we're just gonna stay there because we're sitting around pouting and saying, well, if God gets me out of here, I guess I'll serve him or do something worthwhile. But instead, not complaining about what you can't do, but do what you can. Um, I think the Lord honors that. He takes the prisoner uh, and, uh, and will raise him up. Paul had that can-do kind of attitude, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight and glory. Now, pause just for a second with that. What's Paul's light affliction? Do you guys remember, did he have any problems? You're like, what does Paul know about affliction? Well, he was shipwrecked several times, left, he was floating out in the Mediterranean Sea, gonna drown. Um, uh, Paul was bit by a viper when he was a prisoner, being taken as a prisoner to Rome. Uh, that's a bad day. Uh, Paul was beaten several times. One time he was left for dead. They stoned him, like they, they like literally like stoned him to death. Uh, outside of the town that he was preaching in. And they all walked away. They oh, we got him, he's dead. Well, there's this pile of rocks out of town and then all of a sudden, a hand pops out. It's Paul who was still kind of alive. Now, now this is where some scholars think he really did die because there's a thing that Paul talks about where he went into heaven, whether it was real or in a vision, he doesn't know, but he had a vision of heaven and then he came back. And from that point on, he said, man, I'm gonna serve the Lord with all my heart knowing what I know about heaven now. And he said, I saw things that were unlawful for me to even speak about. That's what Paul said. Um, some believe it was at that moment when he was left for dead, he, he comes out of the pile of rocks, dusts himself off and goes back into town and starts preaching again. Um, this is Paul and he calls all this stuff that I just mentioned, that's a light affliction. We get all upset when Taco Bell takes more than five minutes to go through the drive through Oh, persecution, suffering for the Lord, you know? No, uh, come on guys, do we really know what suffering is, I wonder? I think a lot of us don't. Um, but our light of fiction, he says, but is but just for a moment, but what does it do? It works a far more eternal weight. There's a weightiness in glory that's gonna come to pass. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal or temporary 
but the things which are not seen are eternal. One of the things we need to do as prisoners is realize um, there's invisible things going on that are not seen. They're not even seen nor esteemed in this life, but it's stuff that we can do and serve the Lord even while in prison. And then the Lord says, if you're faithful in prison, I'll give you more, uh, more work to do. Well, that brings us uh, to, what are we on, number six? Um, number six, workman, a workman, a laborer. Verse uh, 15, uh, I'll get back to verse 14 here in a second. But verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knows them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. This is a workman. Uh, study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman <clears throat> that needeth not to be ashamed. <clears throat> the word workman is an interesting Greek word. It's a, a guy who's working to the point of sweat, um, perspiration, literally sweating it out. Um, uh, when was the last time you studied the Bible to the point of perspiration? Uh, um, some of you are like, back when we were in the warehouse, Pastor Brett, Wednesday night Bible study in the summertime, we were all there sweating it out because your air conditioning didn't work. Yeah, that was, that was working. But, um, but the idea of, you know, we all love somebody who's a hard worker, that's a good thing. But um, we're called as Christians to do some heavy lifting, some good work when it comes to the word of God and not to be slothful in the study of the word of God. And the man that does that, rightly dividing the word of truth, um, he's gonna be solid. But he says, shun vain and profane babblings. Boy, there's a lot of that going on. Um, you might just say, shun social media. What a waste of time. Well, Brett, you're on social media. Um, actually, I'm kind of not. It's funny, uh, um, you know, our comms team sort of helps run my social media because uh, it's too hard to keep up with it all. And, and it's just too painful to see what people are posting uh, about their lives. Uh, it's just hard. Uh, so I don't really do much on that. So if you're there saying, hey, Pastor Brett, I have a Bible question for you. You probably won't hear from me because I'm not on there because uh, it's a waste of time. Well, why are you on there? Well, it's a good place to announce stuff and let people know what's going on, I guess. But uh, I can't really recommend spending time doing vain and profane babblings. I would say a lot of news that we watch is vain and profane babblings. It's a huge waste of time. Uh, spending time doing what we're doing right now, this in the word of God, this is gonna be life-changing, uh, or can be if we let it. But all the other stuff we do with our time, listening to vain and profane babblings, uh, that's not getting the work done. And, and we're supposed to shun that and watch, watch out for that. Um, and watch out for those people that uh, eat away at, at solid foundations. The, um, there's two guys, Hymenius and Philetus, that are named here by Paul. How would you like your name in the Bible as being a bunch of losers? Uh, that's these two guys uh, who erred from the faith, uh, which is something we don't wanna do. So being a good worker, uh, I like the story, Christopher Wren, who designed St. Paul's Cathedral in London, one of the world's really most beautiful buildings, um, wrote about uh, the re reactions of construction workers when he went to survey his designed building and see the building of it. He, uh, he wrote an article about the, the workers uh, when they were asked what they were doing. Some of the workers who were bored and tired responded, I'm laying bricks or I'm carrying stones or I'm doing this or that. But one worker who was mixing cement seemed cheerful and enthusiastic about his work. And when asked what he was doing, he replied, I'm building a magnificent cathedral. Uh, different perspective. Do you look myopically at what you're doing and say, well, I'm just going to work today or I'm, I'm just getting up and brushing my tooth uh, or I'm just you know, earning a dollar or I'm trying to survive. Or are you saying I'm, I'm developing a, a wonderful family who's following Jesus Christ? Like looking at the bigger picture. I'm, I'm serving Christ for all of eternity and, and preparing for heaven. Like trying to step back and what am, what am I really doing? And to have the bigger picture in view can often inspire you to be a good workman. Um, have you ever noticed how hard you work when it's something you're excited about, but how not hard you work when it's something you don't like? Biggest mistake I made in work was when I was in high school. I think I was probably 16 years old and my uncle, uh, my uncle Gil, he was a big, strong dude um, and he, he needed help. 
Uh, and he said, Brent, I'll pay you, uh, you know, if you come help me build this fence. I'm like, oh, building a fence, easy peasy. So uh, summertime, trying to earn a little extra money, I went and got this job building a fence. Here was the problem. The fence was a mile long out in Southern Oregon in the, in the country there. And it started at the highway and went straight up a hill, like to the top of a mountain. And guess what this, 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 this rancher who had this, he was loaded with money, he had tons of money, and he wanted railroad ties for fence posts the whole way up the hill. Railroad ties, not the light ones. You know which ones I'm talking about? The big, heavy, I think they're, are they oak? They're, whatever they are, they're, they're hard, heavy. And, and my uncle said, yeah, all we have to do is carry all these, uh, you know, because it was thickly forested up in the hill. We had to carry all these railroad ties up, up to the, you know, all the way for a mile up this hill. Um, and the problem was, is I got paid before, like before we even did the job. Have you ever been paid before you got the job done? Now, one thing my dad taught me is if you got paid, you get the job done and you do it well. But man, like I'd already spent the money. Like, like I spent the money and I'm still hauling these railroad ties up this hill. And I remember my, I remember my legs just shaking because of the, you know, it's just like doing a massive squat uh, workout all day for eight hours. Uh, and then, you know, the next day I'd just be like, my legs would show up to work and I'd be all, you know, like, but, I'll tell you what, that was my junior year in football. We had a great football season that year because my legs were in really good shape. Um, but I'll tell you, man, sometimes I think we, we just get the work and we're just doing the job and it's begrudgingly. But, but if you understand what you're doing, serving Christ, um, you're, you're building something, you know, you're building a beautiful cathedral. You're not just hauling bricks. Uh, keep the bigger picture in mind because that's what we're doing. Um, um, I love, you know, Paul tells in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, Colossians, Paul said, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. We're not serving men, we're serving the Lord. Well, Brett, I, I work at Intel, that's not serving the Lord. Oh, you're working for the Lord at Intel. Whatever you do, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, um, not unto men, um, and do, it, do a hard, good hard work. Um, okay, so that's, now we're gonna be a little more creative with our, uh, our occupations, our jobs. Um, this is where you have to almost be a little more imaginative. Number seven, you and I are called to be a vessel, an honorable container. Take a look, uh, verse 20. It says there, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. In other words, there's beautiful vase or a vase that holds a flower or something. And there's a toilet bowl. Uh, which one are you? Are you a toilet bowl <laughs> or are you a fancy vase? But I'd rather be a toilet bowl uh, or a spittoon. Speaking of my high school, we were out in the country and my buddies had these, they were all goat ropers. Like that's the, that's the school I went to. And they all had their spittoon on their dashboard. This is back in the eighties, you know? And these guys would chew their Copenhagen dry them and they'd spit. And sometimes it made it into the spittoon, other times it didn't. So it was really gross riding in their trucks and stuff. I didn't like that very much. Um, but when I think of a vessel of dishonor, that, that's the vessel I think of as a spittoon. Uh, which one are you? Because see, it says some, you know, are vessels of honor. In a great house, there's a vessel of, of uh, uh, gold, uh, wood, of earth, verse 20, some of honor and some of dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be, um, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee. Also, youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. Um, the idea of the vessel thing is it's not as much what the vessel is, but it's what is in the vessel. Is your vessel um, full of stuff that's defiled, grotesque? That's what makes you a vessel to dishonor. Um, but if your vessel is full of good things, then you're usable and the Lord's gonna use you as a tool that's gonna, he's gonna fill you up to be used for something important, for every good work, verse 21. So purge yourself, your vessel, from all the bad stuff. Um, do you guys still have some Copenhagen in your vessel? Or some poo? If you're the toilet? I wonder if some of you guys are, well, I'm not gonna say it, but full of something. 
And it's because of what you fill yourselves with. We, we, we don't wanna be full of grotesque things. The Lord says, purge yourself from that. And, and then he brings it to more uh, like practical terms when he says, verse 22, flee, run for your life is the idea. Youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You are called to be a pure vessel that's usable for the Lord. And if your vessel's not pure, you're not gonna be usable. That's one of the biggest problems with filling yourself with pornography or filling yourself with um, anything that's uh, you know, grotesque, sinful stuff. Lust, pornography is probably one of the biggest ones that men are being filled with. And it, it suddenly, um, it almost like will disqualify you from being used by the Lord. Um, well, Brett, nobody knows. I'm doing this in secret. Yeah, but the Lord knows. And he's the one that is the one looking at the vessel. Um, we are called to be a vessel. Um, it, it's what, uh, you know, Second Corinthians says very plainly, but we, Christian church, have this treasure in earthen vessels, jars of clay, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, you can either fill your vessel full of pornography and grotesque stuff that stinks, but you won't be usable, or you can, you know, flee that stuff, flee fornication, it says, flee youthful lust, get run for your life from that stuff, and follow righteousness, faith, um, charity, peace, with, with other brothers that call out in the name of the Lord. This is a, a thing we do together, uh, it says there. Um, but, but foolish and unlearned stuff, the strife and all that stuff, get rid of that too, but follow after righteous faith, charity, peace, um, with other brothers that do the same. And then we have the excellency of God that fills our vessel, and it's not from our own power, but it's of God. That's when you start doing stuff that's way past your skill set. Wow, I didn't even know I had that in me. I didn't know I could do that stuff. Well, you couldn't because it's the excellency of the power of God in your vessel rather than the other stuff that was there before that stinks. Brad, I, I'm a little worried about that one. You're making me nervous now. I like the farmer, the soldier, all that stuff. I can relate to that, but a, a, a pure vessel? How do I clean out my vessel? Well, that's the easy part. Jesus does that for you. Um, that's where you repent of your sins. And you say, well, Brett, I, just, I was sinning even just yesterday on this stuff. Yeah, but good news, if you repent, truly repent, say, Lord, will you forgive me of those sins? The Lord says, I am faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from some of the unrighteousness. No, all of it. Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You are squeaky clean when you come before the Lord. And by the way, there's no greater way to acknowledge that and receive that than the table of communion. When you go to the communion table to confess your sins, um, though our sins be as scarlet, they become white as snow. Though they become red like crimson, they'll be white as wool, the Bible says. So making sure your vessel is clean. If you let your vessel go dirty and defiled for a longer time, the stinkier it gets and the more useless you become for things of God, for things of eternity. And this is where men fail all the time. You know, speaking of football, um, you can't run the play that we played more than once. You know, that's the kind of play that you can fake every out once, but uh, they'd, you'd get onto that. Um, but if you do have a play in football that works every single time, um, then when I was in junior high, we had this team, it was a, 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 a school scenic junior high, I think is what it was called. And we went to scenic and played them. They had this, this eighth grade kid that um, was like 400 pounds and he was like 6'2". Uh, and he's 400 pounds. He was, he was not, a, he was not a, an athletic guy, but he was just giant. And I remember he, they just ran up the middle. He was their tailback. And they just give him the ball and he's just, and we'd all be dragging as little junior high kids, you know, and, uh, and, and he would just make a guaranteed 10 or 15 yards every time. So they just kept running that play over and over again. And you know, Satan's got a fairly short playbook and that playbook, he runs one play and he runs it over and over and over and over again because he gets uh, first down every time. And, and why does he use that? Because it's effective. What is that? Lust pornography, sexual immorality. Man, he can, he can stop the greatest of men with that. I mean, how many great men who were doing pretty good but went down with some sexual scandal or some problem with lust or, or pornography and stuff like that? It's the sin that's gonna beset men and it keeps us down. It keeps us from being the fathers, the grandfathers, the husbands that we're called to be and our vessels are just full of just grotesque stuff. It's time to clean your vessel and fight and do warfare. That's the spiritual battle of a good soldier. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness. 
Um, well, uh, number, number seven, your vessel. You gotta have an honorable container. Uh, quickly, uh, number eight, uh, we're called to be a servant. You might even say slave. Um, and you're supposed to have a, a, a right attitude. Look at verse 24. It says, um, it says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Um, this, is, this is something to have the right attitude, uh, servant. Uh, the word is really slave. Um, to have the right heart and the right attitude. Um, Mark chapter nine, verse 33, uh, it says, and, and he, Jesus came to Capernaum and being in the house, he asked them, um, what is it that you've disputed among yourselves by the way to the disciples? Here they were arguing. But they, the disciples held their peace, peace for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest, which one of them was the greatest. And he sat down and called the 12 and said to them, if any man desire to be first, he must uh, the same shall be last of all and the servant of all. Being a servant is what Christ calls us to be. And that's not popular in today's man uh, sort of behavior. I'm no, I'm not, so you're not the boss of me, you know. But to have a heart and attitude of a servant is what Jesus did. He made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. And that's what it tells us here. Paul tells Timothy, um, be the servant of the Lord. You, you must not strive or, or argue with people, but be gentle unto all men. Gentleness. Uh, that's something that a good, solid, biblical man is. He's gonna be a servant. Um, how are you at being a servant? There, there's an old saying, uh, I think it was uh, maybe Gail Irwin, a guy who's a preacher, old guy, who used to say, um, you'll know how you're doing at being a servant when people treat you like one. If somebody treats you like a servant, um, uh, it, it, it's funny what your heart does when people treat you like a servant. Um, I was, uh, I was at Monty Williams' uh, wife Ingrid's memorial service at a big church in Oklahoma. I was doing part of the memorial service there. Um, and uh, Ing Ingrid was killed in a car accident. It was a, a horrible deal, you know, and good friends um, um, of Debbie and I, Monty and Ingrid. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, I felt really out of place there. You know, I was wearing, I, made, I had to wear a suit, you know, uh, that's the first problem. Um, so I'm wearing this goofy suit, you know, and, and I'm there and, um, and, uh, I, was, I was just kind of standing there, you know, uh, just looking for ways I could help. And I was gonna sing a song uh, with my family at this memorial and be, you know, be a part of it. Um, but this, this giant church in Oklahoma, all of the NBA was there, by the way, like everybody in the NBA. Uh, it was quite a crowd there. Uh, and so there's everybody's, you know, like six, five, seven feet. And then there's me uh, in my dumb little suit, kind of, you know. Um, well, this, this guy comes walking in, he looked larger than life. And he was, you know, he walks in, hey, and he says, hey. And he called me in uh, like um, a name, like, you know, Gibbons or whatever. He said, come over here, Gibbons, you know, get, get, get. And he starts bossing me around. And I'm like, wow, like, who is this guy? He thinks I'm somebody else. But he was, he was treating me like, like he knew who I was and he was bossing around. Well, as it turned out, it was the senior pastor of this giant church. And I guess one of his employees that worked there um, uh, looked something like me. Um, and he had confused me with the, uh, the guy that was in charge of doing something. And, and uh, I just remember think, thinking, uh, like, I, I wanted to get like this close to his face. I was like, you gonna make me? You know, like, like I, I was like, this guy's treating me like a servant. And, the, and then I remember just feeling like, oh, wow, uh, this, is what it, this is where the rubber meets the road. I have to, I'm being treated like an underling at this church of the senior pastor. Now, <clears throat> in truth, that senior pastor could have taken a, a few notes from Jesus on his attitude. Um, but I felt sorry for whoever Gibbons was because uh, <laughs> the guy was treating him like some you know, slave or something. Uh, but <clears throat> but I, I just think you know, that there's no place for that kind of behavior uh, in Christian church. We're to, we're to be servants. And even the greatest are gonna be servants. That's what Jesus taught. Speaking of teaching, um, we got... Um, just a few more minutes here, uh, we're almost done. Number uh, nine, apt to teach, a teacher. Uh, we see that in verse um, uh, 24, uh, the second part. He's, he's a servant of the Lord, not, not must strive, but gentle to all men, apt to teach. Able is the word apt, able to teach, patient, in, in meekness, instructing or teaching those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance, to the acknowledging of the truth, um, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. 
Um, what are we supposed to do? Apt to teach, and how do we teach? In meekness, um, t- instructing who, those who oppose themselves. Um, this is heavy, uh, because I'm a Bible teacher, that's what I do, but we're all as men called to teach to some degree, whether it's teaching your children or teaching the people you work with. Um, we gotta be able to teach in the attitude of meekness, even against those who are opposing themselves. Like who is opposing themselves? Remember the people I told you about, the LGBTQ that are pro-Palestinian? They're opposing themselves. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? They're, like that, they're, they're misinstructed. They do not know what's going on in, in uh, you know, so-called Palestine and what have you. Um, so what do I do, yell at them? Do we scream at them and pro- counter protest against them? I think we're supposed to, in meekness, instruct and teach the truth, those that oppose themselves. That's, uh, there's a lot of that going on, the old opposing. People that are opposing themselves, they're doing things that are hurting themselves because they're not instructed. They have the wrong information. That's the definition of our culture. Our culture is misinformed on um, a millennial of issues, like millennium of issues. There's thousands of issues people are totally wrongly instructed on. So what do we do, yell at people, scream at them? No, in meekness, instructing those, teaching. And that's what we hope to do here at Athey Creek. Um, it's hard because sometimes I feel strongly about something and I'll go back and listen to a teaching that I've done up here and it comes on a little stronger than I meant to be, like, or like maybe a little too you know, yelling at people. But at the same time, we're supposed to do that in meekness. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a style out there of pastors that people like that's tough and you know, really getting in people's face and telling it like it is and stuff like that. Um, I don't think that's how Jesus taught. I think there was a spirit of meekness. The one autobiographical statement Jesus made of himself, uh, I am meek and lowly in heart. That's what Jesus said. So um, I have to be careful because I, I kind of like to get in people's grill sometimes. But uh, that's not the way the Bible says, in meekness, apt, able to teach. Um, I told you I'd go back to verse 14 because it kind of goes to the same topic. Verse 14, of these things, put them, the students, in remembrance, uh, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. So we're supposed to put brothers in remembrance of things. Um, Are you reminding your kids of truth from the Bible or your grandkids? Um, I'm so thankful. My dad to this day will say, hey, Brett, don't, don't let Satan get a handle on you. He'll remind me. Um, don't let Satan jerk you around. Watch out, Brett. Satan wants to get you. You know, like he'll, he'll remind me of those things. And more, you know, Brett, don't be prideful. Watch out. You know, and, and I've got a dad who just kind of constantly is putting in remembrance. A good teacher puts in remembrance uh, the, the things that are important. And, and re- you might think, well, I already told my kid back when he was in kindergarten not to be prideful. Um, no, that's something you're gonna have to remind your kid every day, probably, if you're a good father who's a teacher. Um, there's just nine. There's a list of nine things. Steward, soldier, athlete, farmer, prisoner, workman, vessel, servant, teacher. Um, we've got a job to do, brothers, and we need to do it well. If you and I take these charges from Paul the Apostle seriously, I think there's gonna be no stopping what God could do through this group of men if we take this stuff seriously. May the Lord give us ears to hear what the Spirit says today. Lord, I pray blessing on my brothers. I pray that we would be men who take these jobs that you've assigned in your word to us, uh, take them seriously. Uh, Forgive us for laziness or apathy. Forgive us where we've just chosen to let our vessels be filled with filth rather than righteousness and peace and and charity. Lord, uh, would you wash us, uh, use us, um, Lord, where we don't have strength and where we're weak, would you, would you supernaturally fill us? For when our spirit is willing, our flesh is weak. And I pray that you'd give us strength to be the men you've called us to be. May this challenge reverberate. May we meditate on this day and night and be like a tree firmly planted by the river of water. So bless my brothers here, Lord. Pray this now in Jesus' name, amen.